could read it. I'm not going to go over everything, but I wanted you to have the information. So nine sluts, uh, signs that you aren't sleeping enough. As you look at that, does anybody think maybe they're not sleeping enough? Mm -hmm. Probably most of us are sleeping enough, right? Okay, so here's some other signs of sleep deprivation. And I'd say most of us have a couple of these. I think alarm clocks are a terrible invention. If we're getting up with an alarm clock or hitting snooze, and we're going, we're not listening to what our body's telling us. And really, probably what we should do is go to bed earlier and be able to get up uh, early in the morning. Uh, this is a nice slide that breaks down the typical person's uh, average sleep requirements. So most of us need seven to nine hours of sleep, and we're not getting enough. Most of us are not getting enough. You can have a night where you might only get five hours and not be You know, three or four days out of the week, you're going to suffer from sleep deprivation. Uh, and these are some of the problems that not enough sleep causes. Um, and you see on the second column uh, a, a rise in blood pressure, uh, increased risk for diabetes, heart attack, and obesity. Um, you have a harder time listening to your feeding center in your brain, so you will eat more if you are sleep deprived, and eat less if you uh, are sleeping well. I think uh, on the column here on the left, um, pain is an interesting one. If, uh, and I had somebody come in today with a lot of pain. She wanted to tell me all about her pain, general pain. And when I looked at her blood work, we're going to talk about this uh, in, a, in a couple of weeks, but she had adrenal fatigue. And I knew she had adrenal fatigue because one of her steroid hormone levels was really low. Um, DHEA is a steroid hormone that the body will use to make cortisol. If you're sleep deprived and you can't make cortisol, that's, a, that's more important than testosterone or estrogen or anything, because that keeps you alive. That's your stress hormone. And if you're, if you're chronically stressed, uh, your DHEA level is gonna drop because you're using that to make cortisol. And when you're chronically stressed and have that much stress, uh, sleep deprivation is one of them, you will hurt more. And she clearly was having a lot of joint pain. I looked at her list, her thyroid was low, her testosterone was low, her DHEA it was low, her vitamin D was low, and I, her insulin was high, and I got excited, like, we can help you. We're, you gotta do these things, but we can help this. Okay, two types of sleep, REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement. This is when you dream. Uh, it's important for learning and memory. So if you're not getting REM sleep, you're going to suffer more with your memory. And you all know this because if you've ever been up all night studying for an exam, the next day it's really tough to remember simple things. Because REM sleep is where your, your mind takes all the, all the um, conscious and unconscious information of the day and puts it in storage. And if you, have, if you put it in the right storage, you can go back and find it. But if you don't put it in the right storage, like you're just throwing it in files and you're leaving a bunch of information in the, in the conscious mind because you haven't got enough REM sleep, you can't even go back and retrieve it when you need it. So it's really crucial for uh, clear thinking and memory. And then we have non-REM sleep, which there are three stages. And we cycle through REM sleep and these four stages of sleep about four times, um, four or five times a night, and a complete cycle is about 90 minutes. So stage one is when you're starting to close your eyes, you're drifting off and you start doing the jerks, but you're still a little bit awake. And then stage two is when you, your heart rate slows down, your body temperature drops, and now you're asleep. Um, stage one wife will fall asleep on the couch and I'll shake her and I can't wake her up. I'll shake her and I shake her. And then when I wake her up, has anybody seen this happen? She's so confused. Like, where am I? What's going on? What are you doing? When, when you're confused like that uh, and disoriented, you're, you, you just came out of stage three deep sleep. This is a crucial stage of sleep because this is when your body heals from any traumas. This is the, when the physical healing occurs. This is when children grow. This is when our body repairs itself. If you're having surgery or recovering from an injury, you need good deep sleep. 
So think of the people that don't get good sleep. Think of the people that work swing shift. Their, their circadian rhythm is all messed up. Think of people who have sleep apnea, who never, they get very little uh, deep sleep. They get very little REM sleep. All they know is they've been bed in, in bed for eight, year, eight, eight hours and feel like they haven't slept at all. They feel terrible because they're in light sleep the whole time. So can emphasize the importance of REM sleep and um, deep stage three sleep. Okay, here, here's just a, a, another way to express that. So I'm not gonna repeat that, just another way to look at the same content. So 50% of our total sleep is in the light sleep and 25% is in the REM sleep and probably 20 to 25% is in the deep sleep, or it should be. So I have a, a Fitbit watch that I wear and with that comes an app where I can follow my sleep patterns. So I wanted to show you that I guess I didn't pen, do this right, but there's when they're judging your sleep score for that night, they're looking at three variables. One is the amount of sleep that's your total sleep. The other one is uh, the quality, the amount of deep sleep and REM sleep, and the other one is restorative sleep, meaning uh, is your average heart rate below. Uh, is your heart rate below the average heart rate of six, uh, whatever that is? So for me, my average heart rate is 61. And this says that 89% um, of that night, I was below the average heart rate. So that's a pretty good score. So I got 23 out of 25 points for that. Um, my time asleep, my goal is seven hours. I just set that on my, on my uh, watch. Um, and I got... Uh, seven hours and 15 minutes, so I got 47 out of 50. Where I had the most difficulty was, and this is the one I'm most interested in, it's the, it's the breakdown of light sleep, this is the REM sleep here, and then this is the deep sleep. So around 1 a.m. I was in deep sleep for a long time and that was almost all that I got. And then it, it breaks this down and it shows you, and what I like to see is what, how is this compared to the benchmark, to the average person? Usually, my deep sleep is pretty good to the average person, but my REM sleep is somewhat limited. It's not as good as it should be. My light sleep is okay. I fall asleep pretty quick, and then when I wake up, I lay in bed for a while. So that was a, an overall score of, um, was a, it was a pretty good score, actually. So 47, uh, let's see, I, I had 90 out of 100 points, and that was considered an excellent night's sleep. Okay, and that was just, uh, that was on the 5th of October. So, let's see, let me show you last week, this is, this is looking at my scores for last week. Um, if, if you're in the 80s, you have good sleep. If you get 90 or above, you're excellent, and in the 70s, you're, you're uh, fair. So these are the, my scores for the different nights. You can see six hours sleep, under six hours, there was one good night. So why didn't I have a better score? It was either not good restorative sleep with my heart rate or I didn't get enough deep or REM sleep. Um, and then this one, so this is kind of my typical. Uh, I usually am in the low, this is a, a poor week for me. I'm usually 82, 83 for my, for my total, total weekly week. average. Um, and I really want to be closer to 90. And then this week, look at this, this score. 86 and I had I had a 90 there and some close to the 90s. You know what I was doing that week? I was on vacation <laughs> I was, and I was look at those this hours of sleep. I mean, I was really enjoying that. I had no reason to have to get up early. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, so the, this is just a list that you can um, look at. Healthy habits to help you sleep better. This is called sleep hygiene. This is something you should all do if you're struggling to fall asleep. And then the last one is um, supplements and medications. So absolutely the, the best thing you can take if you're struggling is melatonin. You need to get micronized melatonin. And in my opinion, you need to get it from Nutrascriptives. I, I'm sure there are other places that sell micronized, but I know the quality at Nutrascriptives is good. And I don't know the other places I could recommend with confidence, but I would use theirs. The starting dose for women is a milligram and for men is three milligrams. And you want to get the slow release. 
and then take it an hour or two before bed and just keep going up until it starts to work. When I started, one milligram knocked me out really good and I was tired the next day. Um, now I'm taking six milligrams and I'll probably end up at 10. One of the reasons I like melatonin is it has powerful anti-inflammatory properties. So not only does it help you sleep, but it reduces inflammation. So you might notice little things like maybe some of your arthritis pain doesn't hurt as much. Maybe if you're a man who's having problems with a swollen prostate, you start urinating a little bit better. Uh, when I heard this at a conference just a few weeks ago, uh, Dr. Rousier, who teaches this hormone conference, he takes 50 milligrams, 100 when he's traveling across the world. And I think I mentioned there was a doctor there that was taking 600 milligrams a day. And we're like, what? <laughs> Why are you doing that? How do you even wake up? And he said, I'm doing it because I had an irregularly enlarged abnormal prostate and nobody knew what to do with it. And now that I'm taking this melatonin, it's gone back down to normal and I want it to stay normal. I want it to be able to, to urinate okay. So that's an extreme. But melatonin is your first go-to. And keep going up. People will say, well, I, I, I've taken it. It doesn't work. Well, you're probably not taking enough. You just have to keep going up until you get the dose that works. Magnesium is great, if, especially if you have muscle cramps, but it can also help you relax. Um, at least 50% of you that have muscle cramps at night, this will eliminate those cramps if you take magnesium glycinate. That's also from nutrascriptives. L-theanine and GABA are other supplements that you can take. You just follow the recommendations. Usually it's one or two before bed. And then we have medications. So the first go-to medication <coughs> would be Tylenol PM. It's got Tylenol in it, and the PM is diphenhydramine or Benadryl. Benadryl is sedating. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with one or two Benadryl. If you have problems urinating as a man, that Benadryl can really clamp down on your prostate and make it harder, so you've got to be careful. But otherwise, for the rest of you, it's not going to be an issue. Then the first prescription that I recommend is Trazodone. Um, you start with 50 milligrams. You can go up to 150. There's, there's no concern about addiction. There's no real side effects other than if it's too much, you'll sleep well but be drowsy the next morning. The other ones I do not like. I do not like Ambien. I do not like Restoril. Um, these have an addictive potential and you eventually it won't work and you'll be frustrated. Um, and then uh, also alcohol is one that a lot of people have a couple of glasses of wine or something at night to help them sleep. And yeah, that'll work, but that's really not what your body needs. So I don't recommend alcohol as a, as a sleep aid. And I absolutely detest the last line. And a lot of doctors prescribe this. And I have a few patients on, one of them is a, a clonopin or clonazepam. That's the one that I use. But a lot of people love these. They do work. They work great. Um, but there's a strong addiction potential. And people just can't function. They, they panic if they don't have their, their sedatives in their purse or their on, on them because that's part of me now. And to try to get them off of that is a difficult process. It can cause memory issues, it can cause hallucinations, it can make you dizzy, make you fall as you get older. And a lot of people start this when they're 50 or 60 and they're still taking high doses in their 70s and 80s. You, you don't want to be doing that. You absolutely don't want to do that. It's going to cause problems. So work on the, the first things on the list and go to the medications last. And Tylenol PM is probably going to be the safest go-to that's, and that's over the counter. So any questions on any of that sleep stuff? Yes. So for the melatonin, like how long before you go to bed? Uh, I, was, I took like a small dose of mm -hmm. it a while back, and I could fall asleep, but I wouldn't stay asleep. Yes. So it helped you fall asleep, right? Mm -hmm. So you, wanna, you probably want to take more. I, I take it at least an hour before I go to bed, sometimes two hours. Okay. And then if you get the slow release as opposed to just regular, that might help you stay asleep longer. But you're on the right track if it's working for a while. You just need, yeah, yeah. I couldn't get back to sleep, and then I was awake, and then I was right. tired. Yeah, yeah. I think you were close. Okay. And yes? Some of the stuff I read said the melatonin can be a long-term, it shouldn't take it long-term. It should just be a short-term fix. Is that what you see a problem with it? No. Your brain makes it, and your brain's making it long-term. 
but you're not making it well and you're not releasing it like it's supposed to be because of our lifestyle habits. So it's completely, if it's natural, if the body makes it, I'm thinking it's, it's good. Shouldn't, shouldn't worry about long-term use. Any other? Yes. Yeah. Um, and you're doing that on one milligram, how long do you wait before you start working your way up? Uh, whenever you're comfortable. If it was me had that experience, I'd be like, hey, that worked for a while. Next night I would, I would have taken a second one. Okay. Yeah. You don't want to be drowsy the next morning. Um, I took, I think I took a nine milligrams one night and I slept really well and I was pretty fuzzy in the morning for a while, so it's probably too much. Okay. Any other questions? I mean, sleep is crucial. We, we're going to talk about exercise and food. We talk about stress, but we often overlook sleep, and we don't want to overlook sleep. You spend a third of your life, or at least a fourth of your life, sleeping. You need to make it good quality. All right, so uh, this week was, uh, we talked about foods that help us heal. Um, I apologize that I have to, I, I'm repeating some of this stuff, but I feel like these are the important take-home messages. And some of this is just review of other things that pound into your minds some of the concepts I think you need to have as a take home. This whole idea that you need to be on cholesterol medicine because your cholesterol is high is wrong. You do not need to be on cholesterol medicine if it's high. If you got heart disease, you had a stroke, you've had a heart attack, a stent, open heart surgery, yes, you should be. But just because your cholesterol is high doesn't mean you need to take cholesterol medicines. Okay, so they should only be used in these situations when you know you have heart disease. So what are the consequences of using them when you don't have heart disease? Cholesterol, uh, if you lower cholesterol, you, lower, you, you can't make testosterone because testosterone is made from cholesterol. So if you take away a man's testosterone, he's going to gain belly fat. He's going to feel weak and tired. Take away a woman's testosterone, it's the same thing. And when you get belly fat, uh, that increases your risk for diabetes, and that increases your risk of heart disease. So theoretically, you can increase your risk of heart disease by taking cholesterol medicines to prevent it. Um, we know that it will cause muscle soreness and joint aches, and the way uh, you fix that is you take CoQ10, uh, because those statins deplete your CoQ10 levels in your cells, and it makes you feel more achy and sore. Every prescription of statin should come with a prescription or a recommendation for CoQ10. So um, why don't they protect you from heart disease? The answer is because heart disease is not a cholesterol problem. It's an inflammatory problem. I, I, I mean, I, I, I want to I say that about 10 times so you've got it in your head. It's an inflammatory problem. You don't want to be inflamed. You don't want your arteries inflamed. The arteries can handle a little bit of cholesterol lining and going inside the arterial lining. But when you get inflammation on top of that, that's when that, that cholesterol plaque gets big and fluffy and dangerous. And you can measure your inflammatory state by measuring your highly sensitive CRP, HSCRP. Have your doctor measure that. You want it to be less than one. Um, one to three is, is not great, and three to 10 is really concerning. And anything over 10, you just have to say, I don't know what this means. Because greater than 10 does not mean you're going to have a heart attack tomorrow. We don't know how to interpret those high numbers. But we know less than 1 is really good. 1 to 3, you need to work on the inflammation. And 3 to 10 is too inflammatory. If you have high levels, the first thing I would say is, how big is your gut? Because if you've got a big gut, your body's going to be inflamed because you make inflammation with that visceral fat. As you lose the fat, CRP will come down. The arteries should be healthier. So if you've measured this before the program and you lose some weight, measure it again later and you should see the CRP come down because you have less inflammation. Okay, and then unfortunately, it's, it's unbelievable how these studies get published and the publishing bias um, and the funding pressures. I've seen it firsthand and I've seen it secondhand as a physician. I I'm telling you. <laughs> Unfortunately, science is not always ethical. There's a lot of pressure for people to get tenured, for people to get um, funded, and there's a, you know, you get, you, 
Pfizer pays for you to do a study for one of their drugs, are, are you going to really try to prove that that drug is not beneficial to Pfizer? Like, they're not going to pay you. They're not going to ask you if they know that you're, not, that you're opposed to that. So there's a lot of pressure there. Okay. Um, and this is just a reminder that it's not about cholesterol, it's about inflammation. When you eat the wrong foods, uh, the lining of your arteries go from healthy to unhealthy because of the inflammatory response of two or three days of fast foods. It changes quickly and it can heal quickly as well. Okay, how important is your gut? Um, Hippocrates said it well. All disease begins in your gut. Absolutely true. What's the biggest barrier in your body to the outside world? Anybody know? Did somebody say the skin? That's, that's a good thought. What has more surface area than your skin to the outside world? Your intestinal tract, right? It covers two tennis courts. It sees everything that you eat. If you eat the wrong foods, it's going to get very inflamed. And it's going to, all those diseases start to go through the gut and leak into the gut. All right. So, okay, we kind of bashed that home before. Celiac disease. I saw somebody today that has celiac disease. Um, she's bloated. She has constipation, diarrhea, a lot of bloating. She says, when I eat gluten, I have problems. When I don't eat gluten, I feel much better. Um, things have changed. The, the gluten content in our foods has gone up remarkably since the 1970s. And this comes from genetically modified wheat and grains that we're growing. That's the only reason. Um, so celiac is a, uh, I'm sorry, gluten is a protein in wheat and high levels. Our bodies say, I can't handle this. It, it really inflames our gut. And then our gut starts to break down. It's, the lining of our gut is like a brick wall with bricks and mortar. And too much celiac or too much gluten too much of the bad foods will cause cracks in that mortar and cause the mortar to disappear and then things slip through our intestinal wall that shouldn't be there. Large proteins in our body says, what's that? I don't know what that is. We need an inflammatory response. So you end up with skin rashes and, and bloating and diarrhea and gas and joint pain because the body is going haywire as things get into the body that shouldn't be there. All right, so this is pretty common. How do you heal uh, celiac disease or how do you manage gluten intolerance? Stop eating those foods. All right, here are some foods that will make us age fast. This is kind of a review too, but it's the same, some of the same concepts. Where do you find trans fats in nature? Nowhere. Excellent. You don't find them in fats, in, in, in nature. Nowhere. You find it in ruminating animals that have four stomachs, in one of their stomachs. And then that's it. Nowhere else. So it shouldn't be in our bodies. All right. High fructose corn syrup. Where, does, where do you grow high fructose corn syrup? You don't grow it. Where does it come from? How do we make high fructose corn syrup? It comes from corn right? And we extract it, we put it through a purifying process, and we put it in high concentrations, and then it's very sweet and very soluble, and it's a perfect sweetener if you're a food company. But it's not good for us. It'll make you hungry, it'll make your insulin go up, and make you gain weight. Uh, and in processed flours, remember, uh, enriched flours are deficient. They're deficient in micronutrients. Does everybody remember that? That's the food, en the, the food Enrichment Act that said we're going to make you add back these four, but they, they didn't mention all the other micronutrients like selenium and magnesium, all the other ones that we need. Okay, so what do GMO grains do to us? They destroy the gut lining. They destroy that, that mortar and the brick wall, and things start to leak in. Proteins start to leak in that our bodies don't recognize. And then the infl inflammatory system starts to go haywire. It's trying to protect us. Okay, so here's the one way you can eliminate, here's the ways you eliminate bad things. You sweat it out, you pee it out, you breathe it out, or you poop it out. Most of it's you poop it out. Some of it you um, urinate it out, and some you perspire. It's, it's good to sweat every day. I, I'd love to have a, 
um, a sauna in my bathroom. I just haven't got there yet. I got to get the toilet first. <laughs> I don't have room for a sauna, but someday I want a sauna. All right. Uh, and then this is how the liver cleans things. So we have phase one and phase two reactions. Phase one reactions is get, gets all the fat soluble things out of our system that shouldn't be there by binding the, the fatty uh, foods. And then we have another one for all the water soluble foods. We can bind that to these, these different um, compounds to help eliminate it. But look at the nutrients that are required to run these reactions. Can you see some things in common? Like B vitamins on both sides, right? Folic acid is a B vitamin. Glutathione requires selenium, which I think it's over here. Uh, no, it's not over here, but it requires, yes, there it is there. Glutathione is really critical. When you drink um, alcohol, you kill your glutathione. You, you kill your only liver, really. And when you uh, take too much Tylenol, you can hurt your liver because it stresses these purifying, uh, detoxifying pathways. But the liver is pretty remarkable how it can recover. Again, we can do a lot of bad things to our bodies. And if we do the right things, it really starts to heal. It's remarkable how it can heal. It takes a lot to get to the point of no return in our bodies. Okay, so how do we enhance the health of our gut? Well, I think, I don't know if I showed you this before, but um, I'm just going to keep moving here. Healing the gut. So we want to drink clean water. Fast regularly, that gives our intestinal tract a, a break. Um, and these vegetables, the cruciferous vegetables, are the best foods, uh, probably the best family to help clean your, your liver and your body. And then and uh, milk thistle is a supplement, and acetylcysteine is a supplement. You want to have healthy bowel movements. You, they want, you want your bowel movements to be soft and regular. You don't want to be sitting and pushing and plop, 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 and look like a deer just sat in your toilet. I mean, you, you want soft bowel movements that slide in, and you get up and you go. Um, so to heal the gut, we need probiotics, high fiber foods. Uh, if you take antibiotics, you really ought to take a probiotic with it, because those antibiotics are killing a lot of the healthy bacteria in your gut. Um, if you're taking stomach acid blockers, you're, you're going to have intestinal issues. You do not want to take those long term. If you have heartburn, you got to figure out why you have heartburn. I started, because you saw I'm sleep deprived, I started drinking like Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi. And then I started having heartburn. And I started saying, okay, I'm going to cut back till it gets better. You know what fixed my heartburn? Melatonin. <laughs> it's amazing. I, I wasn't expecting that, but it's worked great. Okay, and then you wa want to avoid these foods that are toxic to your gut. All right, healing the gut some more. Let me just slip through these. Oh, let me go back here. Uh, so here's some supplements. But, you know, this supplement list is a pretty much the supplements I gave you last week. I just put in bold face those supplements that will help your gut. But I already, I've already recommended a B-complex for everybody, magnesium glycinate, um, vitamin D. Those three are given. I think everybody should take those. All right, so we need to eat to live, but how do, do nature's foods help us live? It's pretty cool. They capture the sun's energy, and then they store that energy. They make these pigments. They make chlorophyll and other pigments, and that's stored energy. And then when we eat that and we chew it and digest it, we extract that energy. Um, if you take those pigments and you put it in a microwave or heat it too much, you're destroying the energy. You're breaking it down. So it has these stored antioxidants, and we, we measure this, uh, the antioxidants by this score called the ORAC score, the Oxygen Radical Absorbance Capacity. Their ability to neutralize free radicals is what that means. Okay, so healthy foods that help us live have a lot of fiber in them, vitamins, minerals, trace elements, and phytochemicals, meaning color. And they contain enzymes that help us digest the food. So why are packaged foods dead? Yes, they're, they're processed. They have no antioxidant properties in them. There is energy in those antioxidants. You can measure that. Just like you could, I showed you in that, if you watch that video with, uh, um, was it Patrick? Uh, let's see, who was that? Uh, Patrick, I, the water video. 
I'm trying to think of the guy that we introduced that. Um, Pat Boone, yeah. Patrick would didn't sound right. But if you watch that video, you could see the, the, how uh, rich that water was in energy by the oxygen reduction potential. Very, very powerful antioxidant. Um, I haven't shown you the video yet, but when I turn my water machine on, uh, I get this, it's cloudy. It's like tiny little micro bubbles. And when the water's coming out into my glass that I'm drinking, if I hold a match to that stream of water, it, it, it catches fire. It's not catches fire, but it combusts. You see it snap and crackle and pop because it's got hydrogen gas in it. And that hydrogen, those, hyd that, those bubbles I'm drinking are hydrogen gas. Very, very rich in antioxidants. But it goes away quickly. It, it dissipates pretty quickly. OK, so we want to eat foods that have energy in them. And those are the foods in the produce section. Crackers and chips don't have it. Cereal doesn't have it. Um, these are packaged foods. They're not, they're not from nature. All right, so the right foods, this is just an image to help you remember. This is, what I'm, this is my goal here. These are the foods I want to be eating. You can still have a pizza every now and then. Not the whole pizza, but you can have pizza. You can have, you know, you can go to drive through McDonald's if you want every now and then, but, but don't make that your norm. This should be what you see on the plate most of the time. And the first thing you've got to be thinking about is how do I get these in? Because that's, look at all these phytochemicals there. Look, the antioxidants, the fiber, the micronutrients, the minerals, those are excellent for us. Um, just can't say enough about those. Okay, so the right foods, we start with vegetables. This is just a list to get you thinking. Yeah, I haven't thought about eggplant. I like eggplant, but I haven't thought about that for a while. Or squash. I know how to make squash really well. You can, you, you know, there's nothing wrong. I'm not going to criticize you if you make squash in a frying pan and just saute it with butter. There's nothing wrong with that other than you've lost some of the antioxidant properties. But pick them up in your, in your salad, your fresh salad. OK, and then fruits. The, what's the best family in fruits with the lowest sugar content and the most antioxidants? Berries. Berries. Excellent. Man, I don't think I need to teach this anymore. <laughs> OK, and then we talk about the right proteins. So if you're going to eat animal proteins, you want to eat health from healthy animals. Healthy animals are eating right off the range. Free range chickens, uh, beef that's been raised, that's pasture fed, not in a feedlot, um, and wild game. And then fish the same way. But it's hard to find fish around here that are, that are really free of heavy metals and, and all kinds of other things. It's, the waters aren't really that clean here. So, it's not probably wise to drink, uh, to eat a lot of sogai or crappie from the lakes around here, uh, at least not consistently. Salmon is probably the best, um, but a lot, of these, a lot of these fish have a ton of mercury in them because they're eating other fish that ate other fish, and all of these heavy metals accumulate as it goes up the chain, um, the food chain. So you want to be careful about that, yes. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on farm raised fish, but I can say that um, th it's not, it's not a natural habitat or environment for the fish. So I wonder what's in that, how clean is the water, you know? You wouldn't necessarily say it was better or worse than... Probably not. I mean, I know, I, like, I've seen some documentaries on tilapia that come from Far East that sounds terrible. Like, boy, I don't know if I'd want to eat tilapia. Um, it, a walleye out of Lake Erie, yeah, I don't think there's a problem with that. Uh, salmon, if you can get them from Alaska or the Mediterranean, some place where it's really cold and it's clean, it's probably better. But it's getting harder and harder to eat these, these really pure fish. And the thing is, is we're never going to be able to eliminate all these contaminants. We're just doing the best we can. So don't be afraid to eat fish because there might be some mercury in it. But be selective with what you eat. OK. And then I wanted to mention whey protein shakes because uh, whey protein is a good protein. We can digest that pretty well. But be careful when you look at protein shakes that have casein in them. Casein is not meant for humans. Casein is for, uh, for calves. We can't digest that very well. And um, we have a hard time digesting that. And that kind of it's like, almost like a glue. So avoid that. 
And then when you're looking at the contents of these protein shakes, most of them are going to have sucralose, which is, um, what is it? Sucralose is, uh, I'm blanking on it. Sucrose. Wait. Splenda. Sorry. <laughs> sucralose is Splenda. That's an artificial sweetener. Probably not the best. And then aspartame, we talked about that. And asulfame is another one. That's, they're common artificial sweeteners, non-nutritive, non-caloric, that are really not good for our nervous system. So try to avoid those. I was looking at this online. I, I was just Googling, looking at what type of whey protein I wanted to buy. And I found some that had stevia and sugar alcohols like xylitol and sorbitol. And I think those are better choices. So just be careful because you'll, you'll find some that it tastes pretty good, but they almost always have <coughs> sucralose in it or aspartame. They're a little higher in sugar. Okay, and then just remember that we can also get protein from nuts and seeds. And we, beans and lentils are a really good source of protein and good source of fiber. And there's nothing magical. I, I mean... I don't, I don't know how, many, how often you want to eat that. I don't know that there's, a, there's the right amount. I just think it should be not as often as most of us eat. And, and I'll, I'll swear, to, I mean, from my experience, I had uh, some steak on Sunday night. I, and I, it's, I love it because my wife can really make it taste good. And I had about six ounces. Next morning playing basketball, I had a harder time breathing. I was more short of breath. And I told her that. She just rolled her eyes like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> but that's happened to me consistently. So I, for me, it's inflammatory. For me, it, it constricts my blood vessels. It doesn't let them dilate when I'm exercising. So I'm not going to eat red meat before um, I play basketball within 24 hours because I I, I'm convinced that it, I have problems when I do it. Mm -hmm. I need all the air I can get to keep up with the young guys. Okay, so how much uh, meat do these animals need? How much protein do they need? Look how big those muscles are in those animals. You see what they're eating? They're eating plant food. They're getting their protein from plants. Um, so we should take that as a lesson. And these, uh, these are not carnivorous animals. They're, they're herbivores with big, big muscle masses. So. The idea that we need a lot of protein is wrong. We do not need a lot of protein. So I, in the workbook and on the handout here, I just showed you how to calculate what your daily protein intake is based on your body weight, uh, how many pounds of ideal body weight you are, and it's a quarter to a half a gram per pound body weight. So I gave you an example. If you're 160 pounds, you need anywhere from 40 to 80 grams of protein a day. You can get 40 or 50 grams of protein a day without really eating any meat type of things. You, if you're eating beans and nuts and seeds and lentils uh, and maybe a protein shake, you'll get there without really thinking you need eggs or um, beef or chicken or fish. Uh, some people feel like when you're trying, to, you're trying to heal from surgery or trauma that you need, or if you're a, a, trying to build muscle and, and bodybuilding, you need more. Those bodybuilders, they, they will go to um, two grams per pound body weight. So if 180 pounds, you're eating 360 grams a day of protein. That's so much protein. Um, those are amino acids, and acids are acidic. And acidity kind of throws your pH off. It leads to inflammation. If you know anybody that's been into bodybuilding seriously, they all have joint issues. Um, and they, there's a lot of heart disease, a lot of erectile dysfunction among bodybuilders. And I, I don't think eating that much protein is healthy. Uh, they eat a lot of protein, and then they take a lot of other hormones to, to look abnormal, abnormally big. But I don't think it's a healthy lifestyle. OK, and then we need some grains. We have to be careful if you're trying to lose weight. You don't want to have these necessarily every day. You, you want to have them in small amounts. But you notice I'm not critical of the sugars. Uh, th these are nature's sweeteners. I just think you've got to be careful. You can't eat a lot of this if you want to lose weight. Uh, you, ha you have to know your mindset, too. I'll put a teaspoon of brown sugar in with my oatmeal, uh, my dried oatmeal, which I put um, almond milk on, with I have blueberries, 
maybe some craisins and some almonds and some sunflower seeds and pumpkin seeds. I, I make it a, and it, it tastes really good, but it does leave me a little bit hungry. And if I ate that every morning, I would be gaining weight. So you have to be careful with that. You definitely want to avoid the high fructose corn syrups and artificial sweeteners. Okay, and then the right fats. So those are the best fats to eat. Uh, olive oil, coconut, butter. Uh, you want to use canola oil sparingly. That is, um, those are from rape seeds, which is natural. Um, and I haven't, I have, I'm not an expert in canola oil, but um, the people that I follow on, on these, this topic are cautious. They don't think it's probably the best. A lot of inflammation with it. You definitely want to avoid the polyunsaturated fats and the vegetable oils because they're high in omega-6s. So there's nothing wrong with having sunflower seeds or corn, um, but uh, there's a lot of omega-6s in the oil, which is very inflammatory. So these are the foods that help us heal, starting with vegetables, number one. And then this is the image again. Okay, so I like this guy, uh, Frank Medrano. If you like to watch some cool things, this guy, he's obviously ripped, but you're not seeing what he's doing here in a still picture. He's holding that position, and with that expression, he's doing one-arm chin-ups. I mean, it's amazing. And he is vegetarian, so he doesn't need a lot of uh, protein. And then we have Carl Lewis and the strongest man in the world, Patrick Baboumian. Uh, in 2005, uh, he's also a vegetarian. So um, I, think, I think the best athletes who are looking for longevity and health are probably you know, more on the vegan path than on a lot of protein, animal proteins. This is just gives you a couple of guidelines as to how you can judge different uh, serving sizes. And then I try, people are, you know, want to see examples of a, a menu. So this is just a, this is just to give you an idea of how you might eat. But it's not about calories. We're not really counting calories. We're being careful with carbs. We're trying to fill up on vegetables, have some healthy fats, and a little bit of protein. So it's not so much carbs, uh, or not so much calories. And this, there's, there's one major flaw with this outline if you're trying to lose weight. Does anybody know what it is? Uh, yep, yep, you're right, too many carbs. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And I'll show, you, I'll show you that in a minute. But if you're trying to lose weight, you shouldn't be eating three or four meals a day. You shouldn't be snacking all the time. Animals don't do that. Okay, so let me show you another slide here. So there's this app, and I think, um, Erica, did you, you've done the Lose It app? Because I think you commented on it on Facebook. This is a, an app that I started to use that really helped me track my calories and, and my, I'm sorry, my carbs. So for weight loss, we want to keep our carb intake to between 25 and 75 grams a day. For most people, 50 grams is a good place to target. So this was my summary on October 13th. This was a couple years ago. And I had, this is what it said. I don't, it didn't tell me my total calories for the day. But I had 50% of my calories from fat, 28 from carbs, and 21 from protein. That was really a, a pretty good day for weight loss. And I had 45 grams of carbs that day. And it, I don't know if I'm going to show you the, the, what I ate that day, but it really wasn't a lot of carbs. I mean, it was a lot of vegetables and some berries, uh, but there was no bread, there was no, you know, it might have been a little bit of beans, but there was not the typical carbs. But that's, that's the ideal breakdown, because fat makes you feel full, and this, and this kind of keep your, keep your muscles intact from breaking down. Okay, so that, yeah, that would be ideal. All right, so this was, this might have been that day. Let me, let me go back here. This was August, no. That was October 13th. Oh, sorry. Yeah, October 13th, and this was October 19th. So I had, let's see what shows up here. 
okay, so for breakfast, I didn't have breakfast. I skipped breakfast. Uh, I skipped a morning snack at lunch. I had my dried, I, you, can, you can make up your own menus on this app. So that was a mix of almonds, uh, pecans, cashews, um, sunflower seeds, and pumpkin seeds, and then a little bit of craisins. Um, so that, that, the craisins just gave it enough sweet taste that it really satisfied me. And then I had a protein shake that had this premier protein chocolate from, I think Sam's Club sells it, but the, the criticism there is it's got sucrose in, or sucralose Splenda in it as a sweetener. Um, so that was lunch, and then at dinner, I had this cauliflower rice. I don't know if you, you, you I'm sure a lot of you women know how to take cauliflower and, and steam it and then blend it, and you can make mashed potatoes out of it. It's really good. Um, so that, and then I had Brussels sprouts, chicken breast, some carrots, uh, butter with canola oil, which we'll talk about later, and teriyaki chicken. And so that was, a, that was a pretty good day for eating. You can see there's not a lot of carbs there. The carbs that I was getting was from vegetables and a little bit there. All right, and that was, maybe that was what that day turned out to be, a thousand, a thousand calories. Yep, that was back to the 13th, sorry. There's the 13th. So there was another day where it was really good, 45 grams of carbs, um, almost 1,000 calories. And you can, see, you can see the summary here on Tuesday, I did really well. This was, I think this is the caloric amount. So I showed you a really good day. <laughs> Not one of my bad days. All right, so another really important thing you want to remember is there are hormones that will make weight loss difficult. And I, I talked to a lady about this today in the office. Uh, she's gaining weight. I said it's got nothing about to do with your diet or your lack of exercise. These hormones have to be addressed. So we know that insulin is what makes fats, so you have to keep your carbs intake down, and you fast. Then hormones. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Cortisol will put fat on you. If you have chronic stress, you're going through a tough time taking care of an ill parent, going through a divorce or any other stress in your life, you make cortisol, you are going to gain weight even if you're doing all the other things right. So you have to manage that stress. Um, and then ghrelin is the hormone that makes you feel hungry. And the more sugar you eat, the higher that ghrelin level goes in your brain and the more you're looking for sugar. Have you ever done that and you've been eating really good for three or four days and then I'm just gonna have a bite of just this one little cookie. And before you know it, you've got three cookies and then there's a, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of rich crackers, and then you're thinking, I might as well have some ice cream, and then there's a Snickers bar, and like it doesn't end. Gerilin is powerful. It'll do that to you. But when you stay away from it, you really can control your appetite. Leptin is the hormone that makes you feel full, and fasting is what increases that hormone. And then thyroid, we'll talk about that in week 11, but low levels of thyroid slow your metabolism down. Kelly got a good story about thyroid. Maybe she'll tell you sometime. <laughs> um, and then testosterone and estrogen. So women, this is, I, I feel for you going through menopause. If we put you in menopause in your 30s by taking your ovaries out, I guarantee you are good, all are going to gain weight. If you're really skinny to begin with, it might only be 5 or 10 pounds. But if it's your average build, by the time you're 50, you're going to be 30 or 40 pounds overweight because estrogen helps you keep that weight off. And you stop making estrogen when you go through menopause or when somebody takes your ovaries out. And men, same thing. We, you get prostate cancer and we shut off your testosterone, there's no way you're not going to gain belly weight. It's going to happen. So, but you, the reverse is not always true. You can't eat bad and not exercise and expect estrogen to fix your weight problems, women. And same for men. I've had men come in wanting testosterone, 60 pounds overweight. And they say, yeah, I, I need some help in the bedroom. I need some testosterone. Well, no, you need to lose that gut. That'll raise your nitric oxide level so you won't have to ask for Viagra. And you'll, you'll, the estrogen, the testosterone that you do make will not convert to estrogen because when men have a big gut, they make testosterone and they convert a lot of it to estrogen. So now they're left with low testosterone levels. So it really comes back to keeping your weight off. But these things all have to be addressed. If somebody's telling you to lose weight and they're not addressing all these hormones, you're missing important pieces of the puzzle. 
Okay, so weight loss. This is another list of uh, things to look at. All right, so we already talked about that. This is a really important slide. This comes from um, Dr. Jason Fung, who wrote the Obesity Code, the Diabetes Code, and the Cancer Code. All same concepts. Keep your insulin levels low. And so this is what happens when we eat like most of us eat. We have breakfast, uh, maybe a bowl of cereal, and then by those cornflakes at 8, and then by 10 o'clock, we're starving again because cornflakes have carbs. They're going to make you hungry. And so you're, now it's a, it's a, a, a bite-sized Snickers bar for a snack. And then lunch, you eat again. And then there's another surge here. And these are all representing insulin levels. And then the only times you're not eating is when you, um, in between your, the snack between dinner and going to bed, and then when you're, when you're sleeping. So the bottom line is when you add up the, the amount of the area under the curve where the insulin level is high versus when it's low, insulin is going to win every time, and you're going you're to get heavy. You're going to gain weight. Even if you're eating relatively good foods, you're going to gain weight. So this is the slide that shows you what happens with intermittent fasting. So here, you're only going to eat, and there's no magical time, but this is a six-hour window. You're going to eat your food between noon and six. So maybe you eat at three, well, you eat at noon, and then you don't eat again. And look, you get this insulin surge, but then it drops. By six o'clock, the insulin levels are low, and the area under the curve here for 24 hours is, is essentially low in insulin, and that favors weight loss. So what happens if you do the same thing, but you extend it out for 36 hours? So now you're going another till 8, 8 p.m. that night. Now you've got even lower levels of insulin and more weight loss. So intermittent fasting is really powerful. People are afraid if they do that, first of all, they can't because they'll be hungry. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. And then they're afraid they're going to lose muscle. And with intermittent fasting, you will not lose muscle. Um, okay, so let me show you. This is a cool study that looked at uh, four days of fasting, how it increases your metabolic rate. So here we've got, um, let's see, the rest, energy expenditure. This is your metabolic rate going up, and this is your weight coming down. So these, this person lost uh, three kilograms, almost six pounds in four days. A lot of it's water, but not all. Uh, but their, their uh, metabolic rate went up 11%, 12%. So you, you don't slow your metabolism down when you do intermittent fasting. You slow it down when you do the keto diet, but not with intermittent fasting. So they did this for 22 days, and it did not increase the metabolic rate. That was the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And there it is. There's, that's, the, that's where they're showing you increase the uh, metabolic rate by 12% in just four days. It, that's pretty nice, right? You're, you're, not waste, you're, you're not taking time to eat. You've got time for other things. You're not spending money on food. Uh, you're just suppressing that hunger appetite, and your metabolism goes higher. You, and you lose weight pretty quickly. This is another study showing you uh, similar kinds of information. Um, this is showing the, the, the insulin levels and the glucose levels as they come down as you fast. And this is showing you the ketones that are created, the fatty acids that you're burning, and the epinephrine that you're making. So these are good things that happen over a, a four-day fast. Here's another one just shows you that you don't lose muscle. This is 70 days of intermittent fasting. It does not burn muscle mass. And what you... What you're looking at here is the, the, the muscle mass, uh, let's see, the muscle mass right here. At day 14 compared to day 70, it's essentially the same. 51.4 kilograms, 51.9 kilograms. Actually, they gained a little bit of muscle at the end of the 70-day seven day intermittent fast. And their fat mass went down. It went from 43 to 38 kilograms, so that's about 12 pounds. Okay, let's see here. So this is just, I'm just giving you some examples of how you could do an 18-hour fast, which is what a lot of you have done. 
this is how I would do it. This to, to me seems the easiest. And, and the best advice I can give you is when you eat in the evening, try to make it a little bit lighter than when you eat at lunch. You, you'll definitely sleep better if you don't eat a lot before you go to bed. This one shows you the, let's see, 24 hour fast. And then this one shows you an example of a 36 hour fast. So you can, basically you just want to mix it up. You don't want your body to figure out what you're doing. And then this is just alternating the intermittent fasting. Okay, so there's another image of the foods you're supposed to eat. And we talked about the right combinations. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read this to you. I don't think I need to. Uh, and some more on the right combinations. The right times, um, I suggest if you're trying to lose weight, you skip lunch, or you skip breakfast, and you eat lunch and then a light dinner. All right, so this week, uh, oh, I need to change this, because this isn't really good advice. Eat up to three meals and two snacks a day. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> That's bad. That's the old Fit for Life program there. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions? We had a, cl a question from the virtual class. Okay. Um, they were wondering if you remember the protein powder that had the stevia. Do you remember the name of it? Hmm. No, but my wife ordered it Sunday night, and I'll, okay. I'll let them know. Okay. Next week, we're going to... Next week is kind of cool because we're going to talk about reading food labels. And this will be really nice for you guys to apply what you've learned because it's really applicable to everything we've talked about. You'll start seeing things on food labels that are going to make a lot of sense. And we pull this together, you'll realize how much you've learned. So it's, it's kind of fun that way. All right. I think, does anybody have any other questions? I want to, we're almost out of time. I want to show you what, uh, what our foods can do to us. <laughs> you might want, want to see it, but all right. And uh, I'll try to show it so you guys can see it on the screen. Um, so let's p open this up. And it goes into the heart right there. Oh, you can't really see that, can you? It's a little, little fuzzy, fuzzy but, but uh, still not. Why is that not? Why is that not coming up here? 
How come they can't see that? Yeah. Bring it a little closer. Oh, there we go. So right there is the wire. Okay. So there's a, I think that said a prosthetic valve in here. Let's see if we can find it. It's kind of slippery. Oh, here it is. Uh, let's see. Oh, you can't quite see it here. Darn it. Just don't have enough light to... Ah, everything's backwards. There, can you see that? Ah. Oh, that's so hard to show you guys. Here, look in there. <laughs> can you see that? Can you see that? It's, it's three valves, and it's, it's a prosthetic valve. You, you'll probably have to come up closer to see it, because I just can't. Uh, it's the aortic valve that's been replaced, and the mitral valve is full of calcium. But that's a little harder to find, so. Does it say how old the person is to come out of uh, No, it doesn't say. So let me try one more time so you can see if I can get enough light in here that you can see that valve. Are we too close? There. there. Uh, oh. Shoot, shoot. Can't, can't quite, quite show you that valve, valve in there. It's, it's, it's down, down in there. 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 Really, really hard, hard to see. see. Sorry, Sorry about, about that. that. Maybe, Maybe we'll have, have better, better luck, luck with the next one. All right. So this, so this one, one says, says aortic, aortic and mitral valve prosthesis with thrombi causing ineffective valve closure. This is another new one. Let's see if we can find the clots on here. Oh, man. Oh, I can see the, I can see the clot in there. That's amazing. Now, let's see if you guys can see this. Okay. We just don't have quite enough light there. Ah, oh, shoot. If you want to see it, you're probably going to have to come up. But right in here, there's an artificial valve, and there's a clot next to it. So this valve, uh, see if I can make it move. Go on the other side. When this person is sitting next to you in a movie theater, you can hear this valve snapping back and forth. Let's see. Is that going to help? It's right in there, but you guys just can't quite see it with the way the light's there. Okay. Anyhow, sorry about that. They're not all going to be difficult like this. Would it help if I turned these staff lights on? Yeah, that might help. You know, I, I always turn those off because of the screen, but it might help. Yeah, that might help. Oh, here's the, okay, what does it say here? It says nothing. Okay, here is a, this is a cool uh, valve replacement. This is a ball and a basket. Can you see that right there? Ah, why is it so hard to show you? There. And that ball just, it's, it, it closes, it just um, wiggles shut and it snaps up against their Sorry, I know this is driving you crazy. There. Okay. <laughs> I know, I'm really annoying you, aren't I? <laughs> I'm annoying myself. There, look at that. I can, I can make that ball move. There. So you can, you can hear that. Yeah. Okay. It's kind of cool. I think we got one more heart here, and then we got some other good stuff. This is a big one. All right, so this says hypertensive heart disease with marked left ventricular hypertrophy, acute anteroceptal myocardial infarction, 
and fibrous pericarditis. Man, this person had a lot of problems. So this was an enlarged heart. Obviously, it's really big. And the left side of the heart right here in particular is really thick. And they had a uh, heart attack in the front part of the heart here. See, this is, the, this is the left ventricle here. It's the inside of the ventricle. Let's see if we got. This is so hard to show you this. Can you see where my finger is? My index finger is right there. That is like paper thin. That's one of the heart valves. There's another one. Uh, right here, but you can't see, but that's, your heart valves are paper thin. They're really floppy. So, um, and I'm not able to really show you much more than the fact that this heart is really enlarged, really thick. And what happens when the wall gets this thick? That's a really thick wall. The arteries are going through that wall to feed that muscle. And um, because the muscle is so big and thick, when it squeezes, it cuts the blood supply off to the heart and can cause a heart attack. So you don't want a big, thick uh, wall of your heart. That, that causes problems. Let's see if there's anything else here worth noting. I don't think so. OK, let's get on to something else. You good? <laughs> so what causes the big, thick heart? Oh, good question. The, the heart gets thick because it pushes against some, somebody's got high blood pressure. And when the heart's squeezed and it goes through a narrow opening that won't stretch, the heart has to get stronger to push that open. So it just responds. It's got to work harder and it gets thicker. Eventually, when it gets, it'll get so thick, and then with that increased pressure, it'll start to stretch out and it gets thin and really weak. And instead of really squeezing hard, it gets sluggish. And then you're not pumping hardly at all, and these people are full of fluid. They can't breathe. They're tired. So it goes from a thick heart to a thin, large heart that doesn't pump. That's congestive heart failure. Oh, man, there's another heart here. Jeez, OK. This is something that'll be a little bit easier to see. So this is a 54-year-old man with a long history of hypertension, diabetes, and cigarette smoking. So what's the risk of heart disease there? Super high, right? Um, admitted with crescendo, which means in increasing chest pain. Five days later, he developed an inferior wall infarct, so a, a heart attack in the bottom of the heart. He went in cardiogenic shock and expired. Note the thrombotic occlusions of the posterior graft. So here's, this is, this is kind of cool. Hopefully you'll all be able to see this. So this is the aortic arch, so the blood comes out of the heart, and this is one of the bypass grafts. There's a bypass graft. Here's two other bypass grafts. So this, this is a four-way bypass. If I Open this up. I don't think you can see the stitching that they did here when they sewed that in. Where is that? Oh, it's right here where my thumb is, but you can't see it very well. There you go. Oh, boy. That's it right there. There you go. See the stitches they did? Yeah. Pretty cool. And um, so what do you notice? So these are real thin. These come from the legs. And what do you notice about this, this vein and this vein? They look different than these two? They're full of clot. So when I told you when you get these bypass grafts with veins, veins don't work like arteries, and sometimes they clot. This happened to my mom three weeks after she had her three-way bypass. One of these had a clot, and it was non-functional. So if you, if you come up here and feel this, it's really hard and firm because there's a clot in there. These, these two are still open. They're still patent. This person was just a ticking time bomb because of those lifestyle choices. OK, that's a pretty good one. All right, I don't think we have any more hearts, so that's good. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a small slice of lung. Yeah, lung here. You see on the outside, it's kind of dark. Um, now, this is normally they're real spongy, like a sponge, but this has been in formaldehyde for a while. 
but that's a, that's a lung tumor there. Probably a metastatic tumor. It's real rubbery. Oops. See that right there? Yeah, there you go. And these are the, uh, the bronchial tubes that, that take air to the lungs. And that's a, probably a metastatic tumor. A, a primary lung tumor will look like a, like a star shape. It's got these little spigots that just spread out everywhere, these little fingers. So this is very round and well circumscribed. So this probably came from some other source. Oh, here's another, here's another lung. This is really bad. Look at that. Look at that tumor. One, two. And this is what, this is actually a pretty healthy looking lung because we've had some in the past that are really black from smoking. Uh, and this is pretty, this is a pretty pink one and it's kind of spongy here, but this is real rubbery. That's pretty sad. Never seen that one before. Oh, here's another lung. Here's a lung that we've had forever. So nice pink color, but on the outside, it's kind of dark. And you see these little holes right there? Good job, Logan, that's really good. See those little holes there? Those are emphysema changes. So when you have emphysema, this is what it looks like. And these little pockets can't, can't move air. The, the air gets trapped in there because they don't, they don't stretch anymore. But when you touch this, it's, it really feels like a sponge. You can just uh, squeeze the water right out of it. And then right here, very subtly, there's a hard rubbery spot can't see it on this side, but this is also a lung cancer. So healthy here, maybe some secondhand smoke exposure, a little bit of emphysema down here, but really a pretty functional lung until this tumor appears. Okay. Yeah, just double them up. Just put them on the same one maybe. Okay. All right, so here's what your artery should look like on the inside this. Nice and pink and smooth. Right down here we see a branch, uh, two branches that goes to your leg. So this is about the level of your, your belly button where the aorta branches out. And then these little holes that you see in here are where arteries come off of the aorta. This sits up against your, uh, your um, vertebrae, your backbone. On the outside of these they're lined with fat and there's nothing wrong with that. That's, you have some fat every, in all your organs for cushion. So this is a really healthy looking aorta. The problem with this is it's, it's small and it's probably from a child because teenagers don't have, most teenagers don't have linings that look like this. Let me show you one that's maybe advanced or starting with atherosclerotic plaque if they still have it in here. Okay, yeah, this, this would be more like a, probably like a teenager's here. So you see the yellow streaks there in that? Let's see if we can hold this up better. It's got some yellow streaking. What does it say here? Fatty streaks, okay. I don't know if you can see that, uh, but there's, there's yellow in there. It's not pink like the other one was. Okay, so this is happening in teenagers. So let's show you one that in somebody that's got advanced atherosclerotic disease. This one right here. There we go. Let's see if we can get that to focus. Is that focusing? So not only is there fatty streaks, but it's calcified, so this is really hard. So this is hardening of the arteries. This is the biggest artery in the body. And you, if, you, if you put gloves on and feel this, you can feel how hard this calcium gets. So that's been there a while, because the body calcifies, calcifies plaque that's been there a while. My dad's uh, Widowmaker artery was 99% blocked. And the reason he didn't block it and occlude it and die is because there's so much calcium in there it wasn't going to break anything was going to nothing was going to break off so what would have happened is it would have gone from 99 percent to 99.5 
he would have not had enough blood flow and had a heart rhythm problem that would have killed him. But he's 96 and he just came to Twin City for rehab. So you can go see him, Jamie. Yeah. Uh, okay, last one here, I think. Here's another atherosclerotic plaque in the lining of the um, aorta. Right down here where it bifurcates, uh, going to each leg is a Gore-Tex graph. You can see how they sewed that in because this person was having problems uh, walking because they didn't have enough blood going down to their legs, so they get crampy. So they, so they put these Gore-Tex graphs in. So you can see with those in there, they'd have to be on a blood thinner because just the way those are shaped, that's going to cause blood clots to form. So they're on a blood thinner too, but they feel a lot better. Their legs are a lot better. They're not painful and fatigued and cramping. But this is atherosclerosis. Did we have that one aorta? Was it, uh, do we see any, um, sometimes we'll see an aneurysm. Yeah, there's an aneurysm right here. I don't know if you can see this. Um, see how that's kind of translucent there? That's the beginning of an aneurysm. And these will get bigger and bigger until they rupture. Okay, so we don't want that. But when you have plaque like this and high blood pressure, that tends to happen. So this is the beginning of an aneurysm. All right, I think, I think that's it. Was there anything? Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so I apologize, you couldn't see it as well as I'd hoped, but if you want to come up and take a look, I'll show you a little closer if anybody's interested. But my question is, is this reversible? Yes, it is reversible. Um, is this reversible? No. <laughs> I mean, you get to the point of no return, right? Um, you, when the heart changes like this, there's certain things that... Almost dinner time. Uh, when the heart gets like... I mean, there's a point of no return with our bodies, so we have to be careful. But like this, these fatty streaks, yes, we can reverse this. So it's really lifestyle. Um, and I think this is really important for you to all remember right here. Those two by bypass graphs that got occluded with clots, occluded because nature did not intend for those veins to work like arteries, and because this person didn't change their lifestyle. It was bypass. It was bypass the blockage, bypass the problem. But if you don't change your diet and your lifestyle, the, it progresses. Just like a stent, we put a stent in and you open it up and you feel better. But if you don't change your lifestyle, the, the blockages are going to occur someplace else. So uh, if you follow these principles, it'll heal. If you don't, it's just going to progress. All right, I think that's it. So I'll stick around if anybody wants to get a little closer.